So today's topic, sediment control 101, for a lot of you, it'll be a refresher, but I think everybody's going to gain a little something from it. We took a plethora of information and we packed it into one hour of fun. And we have a list of topics that we're going to go through. It's similar to what you'd see on our website, similar to what you'd see on our product line card. Uh, so bear with us. Is sometimes we're going to have to speed up and go a little quickly through here. We have a number of slides, a lot of content to get through. But Don, I'm well, excited. I'm just excited to be doing this. You know, this is for all four companies: ASP, Quick Supply, Bowman, and Cascade. There's a wide range of products based on local interest, local availability. So you have to keep that in mind with some of this. Uh, but hopefully, we can uh, uh, inform you today on some things maybe you're not familiar with in sediment control. We usually, when we do a lunch and learn um, at your office, which we are looking forward to do, we're going to talk on talk about that a few times through this presentation. Uh, we introduce ourselves. Not everyone knows exactly our history with our different companies. Uh, Don and I both work for all four of these companies, Quick Supply, ASP Enterprises, Bowman Construction Supply, and Cascade. Uh, we have a map that shows where we're located. We're all part of the Hale family of, of companies. And Together, we have well over 45 years of experience with our different companies. We kept the companies uh, that already had an identity, ASP Enterprises, for example, have been around for decades. Uh, we stayed with all of our local force. We have a ton of people who worked for our company for 20 years or more, and we're really proud of that. So we don't have a, whole, a lot of turnover. We're still familiar people. We're local to our markets. Uh, here's a map that shows where our offices are located, where we do most of our business. But we're blessed to say we have friends in all those gray shaded areas as well that do exactly what we do. And we have this awesome network that has only grown stronger over the last several years. of uh, People that we can help you with projects in other locations, even if it's not right here in your home market. Any yep. questions, reach out to us. Yeah, Bill, one thing I would just want to reiterate is we are the largest family owned company uh, still around in the United States. There's been some, some consolidation in that world. Um, but, you know, they're, we're all locally operated, locally run. So that, that's why we have different names, because we think it's important to realize that it's all locally run. That's awesome. And that's part of us being your most trusted site solutions provider. We are going to go through uh, the you know, sediment control solutions today. But I just like to remind people, if you're not sure if we carry a solution or if we have something that can solve your problem, reach out to us. We have a lot of things that we haven't even had a chance to tell the world about. So we have uh, information on a lot of different solutions, even competing products with what you might typically see us offer. Uh, we have so many things we could offer because we're blessed with being a very good logistics company. We can take train loads, truck loads of product, break it down to exactly what you need, where you need it, when you need it for your job site. Um, we're a lot of people are short right now on uh, drivers or warehouse people. I can tell you all of our facilities are up and running strong and we're very, very busy this summer and we're ready to help serve you. Yeah, a lot of inventory available for sure. And uh, we always try to make sure that if we're going to suggest you use something that it's easily accessible. And we do have the information to tell you if something that is specified on a project is not available, won't be available for a while, uh, we can help you with alternatives and help get those submitted and approved as needed. Keep the project rolling. Uh, you know, we have friends in the industry that do a really good job of terminology, and they try to teach the differences between erosion control and sediment control. Building up to our technical talks webinar series, Don and I were wrestling with which one do we say, do we present first? Do we present erosion control, then sediment control, or vice versa? Uh, there is a difference. There's a lot of overlap when those products come together. Um, but, you know, when people talk about particles breaking loose at the soil versus transporting down through the site. That's where you start to get in the different terminologies. I'm reading the black text. Don's reading the red text. Yeah, really the erosion control, we look at that as being a proactive solution, right? Keep the soil in place um, so you don't have to try and collect it. Sediment control, on the other hand, is reactive. Now we've had some erosion issues and we've got to capture that soil. Let's be clear, there's always going to be a need for sediment control because we don't either have time or, you know, at the beginning of a project, you just got to make sure you're keeping the, the waters of the state clean. So that's why you need sediment control. But as fast as you can look at erosion control and get it in place, the better you're, you're going to be in the long run. Oh, there's our logos. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just continuing the same thing about how they go hand in hand. Anytime you have an erosion control project, you better have sediment control plan for that project to protect the adjacent properties and your own property and receiving waters while you're waiting for the erosion to establish. And again, sorry, <laughs> we, we strive for erosion control. We use sediment control when we need to. Um, and it says, you know, when, when we don't have erosion control fully established. So even when we put blanket down, 
We still need uh, a sediment control in place because we got to wait till that grass grows. You know, that's that's just the fundamental we always look at erosion control versus sediment. Before we agreed to do this webinar together, Don said, there's only one thing I ask of you, don't read my part. <laughs> I already kind of jumped on it. It wasn't on the screen yet, so I didn't know. Yesterday, I joked that I read the black text, Don reads red text. It's kind of like he's sediment control Jesus. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> Not even close. Funny, Thanks, so. Okay, next. So, oh, we, we had this highlighted as to who's going to present which. Don went over it right before this presentation, and I didn't. So, we have within sediment control a lot of subcategories. If you you're doing SWIP management and you have a, a SWIP plan for your site or someone's just showing up and um, expecting you to do something better than what you'd already done, we need you to stay flexible. What I want you to think about is our goals are all the same. We're trying to keep sediment on site, but there's going to be a lot of different ways you're going to need to achieve that. And even if you have a plan in place, sometimes you're going to find out Mother Nature uh, laughs at your plan or the way the timing works out on construction sequencing. You might have to come up with something that was not part of the original plan. We have everything in inventory that Don talked about, so we can be flexible and help you adapt as needed. And we only hope, go back to just one slide, we yeah. hope your, your site looks better than this one. <laughs> uh, this was actually a development site you can see on there from 2004. And we've come a long way since 2004, for sure. Um, but it is important that we always look at the effective ways to do it. And like Bill said, when you do make changes, uh, one of those fundamental things, you always got to make sure you change your, your plan that might be inspected because they want to see a current plan. And I think it's funny that um, we use some bad examples because I'm sure no one on this webinar has any projects that look at anything like that. No way. <laughs> no, <it's been> <laughs> it happens, man. <laughs> Nature happens. I mean, if my last name's Murphy. If there's something that can go wrong, it will. Uh, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. So <laughs> perimeter protection, we don't um, get, we won't get too deep into silt fence here. We just want to make sure everyone knows each state has their own approved list. Every um, market that we deal with has their own preferred type of silt fence. We're in tune with that. We have everything you need to satisfy your DOT approvals, but we also have alternatives. So Don and I will touch on that here in a little bit as we get into it. Uh, as we go through the perimeter protection, you'll see these categories I won't read to you. Just know that we didn't list everything we offer. We listed some just to touch on them, to give you an idea of what we offer. Part of what Don and I want to try to achieve is to give you a little more information on what to use, where to use it. Yeah. With silt fence, the primary thing to, is to make sure it's properly installed, inspected, and maintained. One of the things we see is uh, some plans might call for a lot of silt fence. You see the little smiles all over the plan. That's not enough if it's not properly installed. Uh, silt fence is awesome. It's very functional. It still works. Some people prefer other solutions, but silt fence definitely has a place in sediment control. The installation has gotten better now that there's a few different machines out there that knife it in and do it properly. But we can tell just by driving by a site very quickly if the silt fence is working or not. Yeah, one of the other big elements with silt fence too is that we all just say the word silt fence, but just in our system alone, I think we have 14 different types of silt fence with different processes. We're going to Oops. talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but that, that's also part of it is what kind of fabric you're using. Absolutely. And we have people who are experts at that. Actually, admittedly, I'm not. I deal primarily in the stormwater solutions, but I love that all of our technical salespeople are very well versed in dealing with sediment control and erosion control products. And we talk about proper silt fence installation. We also talk about location. Where is it at? What's the spacing? The post spacing to make sure it's satisfying holding the fence up. We want to have that fence get three quarters full and that's going to be a tremendous amount of load. We also need to make sure that whoever's installing that is maintaining it, keeping an eye on it. Sometimes part of restoring the site, pulling out, cleaning out silt fence means you're putting in other rows of silt fence in between to make sure you're still providing protection. What you don't want to do is undo all of your success, all your progress, and redo it every time, and then you have this vicious cycle. We're working towards an end goal. That's establishing the site and having not having to need sediment control anymore. You know, this slicing method really is still the bee's knees. I mean, the, the <laughs> challenge here is that if you have really rocky uh, subgrade, it may be kind of difficult. So in certain markets, Nebraska, Iowa, you'll see a ton of this being done. When, when this silt fence gets installed, they literally will cut it off the ground because they just can't get it back out. And that's really the big thing. You're trying to make sure water duct can't undermine that silt fence. Absolutely, because that is typically how it fails. And the other great thing is then you can put your, pacing, your post spacing however close or far apart you need to based on if there's going to be a lot of water come in there. If there's not, you know, it just gives you flexibility. 
So if it's placement, you can obviously see, this is an obvious example about correct or incorrect, that we talk about J hooks, we talk about smiles. Uh, proper soap fence placement is the key to the success. Cities are beating that drum. IECA is beating that drum. And they just want to keep saying the message over and over again until everyone gets better at it. Well, you know, when you look at this slide, the one on the left, how much better are you collecting sediment in small gulps, like Bill always used to talk about in stormwater? You've got small gulps that, are, that will also dry out faster. So that when you have to regrade, now you've got that, that sediment in different places, as opposed to if you have a silt fence just doing the perimeter. Then you have all of it close to the road. You got to deal with that. It's going to stay wet forever. So there's multiple advantages to doing that. And you can see when silt fence is successful, if it's properly ponding water and letting that sediment fall out of it as that uh, before the water passes through, and you're, you're capturing the sediment. You're holding it in place. You're doing exactly what you want. And this street is clean. Waddles, we have a lot of different options here as well. And we carry a lot of different uh, waddles throughout all of our markets. One of the things that people like about it is they don't have to uh, have the large equipment to get it to site. So some of the smaller areas, waddles can be carried in by hand, uh, 100 feet, 100 foot roll can be carried in by one individual. And then it can also be used for breaking up a slope, as you see on some of these images on the right. You may not think of that as perimeter protection, but it is. If you don't have those slopes broken up and you don't use some of the waddles integral throughout your site, ouch, then you, you're just putting a lot of burden on whatever, whatever you have along the perimeter of the site. You're not taking the small goals. You're leaving a large area to create some rills and goalies. By then, you already have failures on your slope, and then you're going to overwhelm whatever's downhill, downstream of that. Yeah, we have to be a little careful when we talk about silt fence replacement. I mean, this, mm -hmm. this nine-inch waddle, even a 12-inch waddle, isn't going to be equivalent to silt fence if you got 30 acres that it's draining to. This is for lot, you know, individual lots or individual sections where you're just trying to, to grab small areas because obviously nine inches that that water is going to uh, overtop because for the most part, a straw waddle is still a dam. Very little water is going to get through that wall. And it won't take much to overtop it, like Don said. Talked about carrying it in by hand. Um, and then this is the other thing is some people don't want to have to go remove product later once the vegetation is established. So they want something that they could just cut apart, leave it there on the site. Yeah, the other thing with biodegradable waddles though is we actually have um, truly biodegradable. So there's no plastic in it at all. And so for those situations, uh, the two that come to mind is Colorado and Oregon by themselves. Typically, most of those specifications now will not allow plastic. So there's either a cotton net or a burlap net that we use to, to hold that, that straw in place. One of the things in between there would be uh, some photodegradable. You see some of our you know, bio net, anytime it says bio, some of those are a plastic that degrades in a short period of time. This, this is a great example. So th this, this field up uphill was fully vegetated and we had to regrade this, this section down here. All we really wanted to do was just have a, a, a stopping point for moving water, any kind of concentrated flow just so that we, our hydromulch uh, field here could get uh, revegetated, work great. Looks awesome, same thing. Yep, and there's a slope break for you. So here we had a TRM on the bottom third of the slope. We just wanted something additional without having to bury the edge of that TRM halfway up the slope. So we stapled it down real well, and then we put uh, this uh, waddle on top of it, again, just as a slope break to kind of stop that water from allowing it to get underneath the TRM. It looks like it worked really well. It did. Silt socks. Uh, we didn't have a lot to say on this because we're up against time. But Yeah, there, there's a ton of uh, different silt socks out there. A lot of them are just using uh, recycled uh, wood fiber. There are still compost socks out there. It yep. can be a very effective solution because it's much heavier. Uh, so in a lot of cases, you can put it even on, like you see here on concrete, and for a you know, small amount of water, it can work very well. Uh, it is an established solution for sure. This, you know, some of the products we'll show, we might show a manufacturer in a case like this that has a lot of products available. That doesn't necessarily mean we have everything that they manufacture in stock in our, in our facilities. We have access to all of them. We can get anything we want mm -hmm. it is for, in a matter of time. You just need to give us enough heads up. And we'll tell you what the lead time is on different solutions. But Gator Guard's one example where they have their standard waddle that is lightweight, foam filled. You see the fill that's on there in the site. And it's designed to pond water, like Don said, not to the depth of silt fence in very small areas, small sections. And I guess the picture on the right showing you how lightweight and durable it is, or how lightweight and reusable it is. Uh, but they do say it's durable. It's made of a material that they're not worried about it getting destroyed if somebody were to drive over it. Um, I don't know how much more we really need to say. No, staking is just really important here because it is lighter than, than water. So it's, it's going to tend to float. So you yeah. just got to make sure it's, it's really 
on the ground well. Absolutely. Other end of the spectrum from the weight, the heavy silt socks we just talked about that are compost filled and yep. blown in place. Yep. A Colorado market is really popular place for the Urtec solutions and the Urtec S fence is really grown in popularity out there. Um, I, it does say it's reusable as they show in the pictures here. This is shorter. Again, not a direct replacement for silt fence as far as height. And it's not even really pond in the water if you can see the openings through it there. Yeah, you're going to see this in a lot of our ditch check stuff too, is that you, you can look right through that and go, well, that's not going to filter water. For the most part, we're really not trying to filter water. We're trying to slow it down, dissipate the energy, let the solids fill out, and then hopefully we have some version of a sediment control treatment train that you get cleaner and cleaner water. Absolutely. This is just keeping material in place. And we did, we did talk to Ryan Anderson. They have used this before um, along Interstate 25, along the guardrail where they had a particular section of interstate they were working on. They secured the, this hard surface guard to the paved surface so that it wasn't letting the debris and sediment leave the paved roadway, the shoulder, and go down the slope. Uh, so there are applications where you might use that and you might need it. And again, that opening size doesn't put a lot of pressure on it so that there's not huge water pressure pushing against it. It's going to flow through it. Like anything else, if you're curious about it, get a hold of your local sales rep, find out what you need to know about it, and we'll do what we can to help you. We're good at giving you options and alternatives. You're not obligated with any one question that you ask. You're not obligated to immediately buy whatever we recommend. And we have the ability to recommend multiple solutions in a lot of cases, depending on exactly what you need at your site and what's going to fit your project. Wattle fence. Uh, we, we had some growing interest in this in the last year. This is something that is trying to compete with silt fence in certain applications, and it is being used as perimeter control, still does need to be staked into the ground. Uh, but there's a lot more we can talk about. It. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, a, again, a biodegradable solution. So that, that's, that's an important part. Um, and it, their idea is that it's an alternative to using wattles, too, in some cases, mm -hmm. where uh, you, can, you can have, what I forget what they say, a thousand feet. Yeah. On a, on, a, on a back of a pickup truck and a thousand feet of waddles would be pretty tough to get in the back of a pickup truck. Yeah. So it, it's just kind of site specific. And there's inst specific installation things you need to look for here, like keeping that apron pinned down to the ground yep. upstream of this so that it's not getting, you know, undermined at all, as we talked about earlier. We can go deeper into detail on this. The manufacturers would love it if we spent a whole hour on lunch and learn <laughs> on every single product that they carry. Uh, this is just another example where the guy is carrying a hundred foot, uh, two foot diameter, two, two foot diameter roll, hundred foot long of protection under one arm. Yeah. And he doesn't have a trench or he doesn't have any of that. So there's just certain applications where that makes some sense. Yep. And there's some details for that. You can look up our website and you'll get more information on it. Ditch checks. Uh, we had looking at the sake of time, we're already 20 minutes yeah. in. We had a lot of good information on ditch checks. Yeah, so let's let's get into it. So if we talk about silt fence again, like I was talking about earlier in perimeter control, silt fence can be used as a as a ditch check. You just got to think about the porosity and the, how much water is going across that that ditch. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute here. Um, rock ditch checks, um, Alan. Yep. Um, rock ditch checks can be a usable solution. You see it a lot. My opinion is always that it's kind of a maintenance issue because if you're really going to maintain that ditch check, um, you're going to have to almost remove some rock to get back to good rock. I mean, yes, you could just put some rock on top of it, but you're kind of burying a, an issue. You can have to do a lot of damage just going in there to clean it up. Yeah. And one of the other things we always note on this slide is the importance of ditch check spacing. And what you can see there is that line on the bottom uh, illustration there. The, the bottom of the upper ditch check elevation is equivalent to the top of the lower one. The idea being is we're really trying to remove that bed grade, or at least a good chunk of it, by that's what you want to do. Now, you know, once a steep slope, you can't put one every two feet. It would cost you a boatload of money. But in principle, that's the idea with ditch checks uh, totally. Uh, and really, ditch checks shouldn't look like this. Uh, fortunately, this was uh, somebody being goofy. But, um, <laughs> you know, we it, the important part here is you can't let water get around it. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, too. So the high porosity ditch check, um, Nebraska DOT does a great job. I think Iowa does too, and maybe there's others um, that actually specify uh, regular cell fence or high porosity cell fence. Here, Nebraska does going across a ditch. And the importance of that is, is the, um, the amount of water, the water flow rate down at there at the bottom. So here you can say this is a typical uh, cell fence, and this is really crazy when you think about it. It only allows eight gallons per minute per square foot. And if you took silt fence in your kitchen sink and you poured water on it, it would pond water. 
So that's really not a filter, right? That's a dam. Well, this one here, this is still not high porosity, but it's better. It's 50 gallons per minute. So here might be a medium porosity silt fence. And again, you don't want to get crazy with different silt fences, but understand there are differences. And then a true high porosity, here's 110. We'll show you some fabrics later that's in the 300 range. So that is important to silt fence. If you're on a large project and you really are trying to do it, like in a case of a ditch check, you want to use high porosity, we can give you the specification that requires, and also the other thing to do is require, if you're in Nebraska or Iowa, just require them to do the Nebraska high porosity silt fence. Um, here's another uh, ditch check product, Triangle Silt Tech, been around forever. Um, really the, the biggest challenge here is, is when they get just filled with sediment, um, they can be hard to, to remove and, and uh, get rid of. But in my opinion, there's really nothing better because it holds in place. You can kind of see the little detail. They've got, it's got a downstream, downstream apron. It's got an upstream apron and it just allows for water not to get underneath of it. Um, these are actually some older pictures, but they still do a great job, especially that bottom one. Rock failed, straw failed, and you can see tridike work. I, again, there's some challenges here to this in the post, but I, I remember this when we first started using this. Uh, we were uh, one of my contractors said, "I don't want to use tridex." I'm like, "Why?" He's like, "They work." He goes, "Yeah, they work too well. You got to clean them all the time." <laughs> I think that's kind of the point. Um, but here again, you can see how sediment gets built up as you go down the hill there. And again, you know, the issue here is once you got vegetation growing, you got to pull these out and get vegetation underneath them. It's kind of another challenge with trying to, again, for temporary sediment control, nothing better out there. Here's a, an ex a simple example to hold back sediment so that that inlet, if you can barely see that four-way yeah. inlet behind it, um, it doesn't get inundated with, with sediment, that it's much easier to clean because a big chunk of that sediment ends up in, the, in that little four bay. Geo Ridge is another one. We do see some of that in Illinois and some of the other markets. Another great product. This is, this is a, well, there's two. There is a permanent product and there is a, I think it's made of starch. It's a biodegradable version. Um, again, it's a very open mesh. It's kind of like that Urtech. You go, how is this doing any good? If water, you can see, look, you can see the guy's boots behind it. How is that doing anything? It's slowing the water down without putting all that pressure on the ditch check but allowing for sediment to build up behind it. Here you can see we did a good job of getting it up on both sides. So the water's not going uh, around it before it goes through it. Um, here you get another big value here is if you see you actually got grass growing through it. So as opposed to the tri-deck, you pick these up, these got 10 inch landscape spikes. You pick these up, pops right out, vegetation is growing, you're done. And it dissipates energy like we talked about before. It Absolutely. might not be a complete dam, but it dissipates energy. That's exactly right. Here you can see the, the opposite. We didn't have enough on this one. This was out in St. Charles County. Um, we should have put one more piece out there. And here's the sediment that you can get. This happens all the time. Um, that's Again, that's how it works, slowing the water down. Um, Urtec, as we talked about, Urtec is very similar to GeoRigin. It's very open like this. They don't do the triangular shape. Uh, but it, again, it can be very similar. Again, that's something that is out in Colorado that's used some. Um, and then the other one we want to talk about is using rolled products. And when I say roll products, so uh, waddles and that kind of thing, when you're doing that in, in a channel like this, you really got to be careful, in my opinion, this is strictly my opinion, is that A, a straw waddle is a dam, so you're going to dam the water up. You're going to have either nine inch or 12 inch vertical drop when it goes over it, which I can build scour on a downhill side. Um, on the, and on the alternative is when you have the TRM in place, you're ready to go and you want to slow that water down. It's a great alternative here because we've got good erosion control on the downstream side. Here's they, put the, they put the erosion control under the dish check versus that one funny slide. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and here's another example here. Again, that can be a great solution. Um, and here, this is using compost socks. And again, you can see great sediment behind it, but this is final stuff. We got a TRM underneath of that there, and now we got scour below it. We really need to take a look at how we're designing this so that we have long-term and final conclusion to a project. Uh, now, here's my one exception on roll products and, and whether they're a dam or a filter, because sediment log, Curlex sediment logs is actually, they've done testing to show that water is actually getting through it besides going over it. So they have different sizes. They can get a little pricey in the 20 inch range. But again, if you need something that tall, it might be worth it. 
Um, and here's, this is right off of their slide. Did I miss the... I think if you backed up, we could at least tell people to find that no, video. there it is. Because we did. didn't have a, the way to link the video. Yeah. You wanted them to go look for it. Well, no, this isn't a video. This is actually a report done. It's a white paper done on sediment log, dam, or filter. And it actually, this was the outcome of it. So anyway, if you Google sediment log, dam, or filter, that'll pop up. There's a couple of different things that pop up. But American Excelsior did that? That's research. right. That's American Excelsior. And so then this was the resulting test that they have done. I can't remember if TTI did this or who did this. It might have been at their own erosion lab. But you can see the difference. If you just look at nine inch curlex sediment log, uh, 42 gallons per minute versus nine inch waddle, it's seven and a half gallons per minute. So clearly water is going through that. Clearly, it, you know, it, that's an advantage for a roll product in, in, as a ditch check. Um, and as we talked about with waddle fence, this is another application where this may be practical uh, to, to be able to install this. Uh, again, very simple to install, doesn't require any, doesn't require any trenching. Uh, there you can see the direction of the flow. You always want to have that flow upstream of the, the stakes on the downhill side. And you can add stakes if you need to, if, it's, if you got a lot of water coming through there. Again, it's only nine inch height. So even if water would go over top of it, it's, it's a fairly low drop. But for the most part, water is going to go through it. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, this one, uh, Bill's going to help me on because he's had some more, much more experience with muscle. This muscle wall check. dish check is amazing. So uh, Ryan Anderson and from Bowman Construction Supply, our company, and Tyler Searle from Muscle Wall worked together with Colorado DOT and I think Kramer Construction. And they had been putting in some straw bales as ditch checks per the DOT. They were getting blown out. I mean, steep slopes. Obviously, it's winter time. There's no vegetation to, be, to speak of. They decided to try to use muscle wall with non-woven geotextile fabric over it. There are holes through the muscle wall where they can ratchet strap the adjacent units together. And those holes allowed for water to pass through. So the muscle wall acted as the biggest, baddest silt fence in the history of the world. And it worked. That stuff, once it's filled with water and set into place, it goes nowhere. It's meant to hold back, hold back floods. And it's held back massive floods and debris flows after wildfires in Colorado and California. So this was a, their first try at it and they loved it and they will be doing it early and often and again and again. The muscle wall is completely reusable. The only consumable in this would be the non-woven geotextile. And this is clearly not something that's meant to be in place forever. This is meant to be in place until they can get vegetation established or to put something else into place. So explain this to me. Yep. This is an empty plastic box. Yeah, you basically. carry it. You can, one person can carry a section down into place. Okay. And then how, do, then how does water just not blow it right out? The, so, the units sock it together. So they're tied together uh, with a connection that's molded into each unit. They're ratchet strapped together, depending on the height of the unit, whether it's two, three, four feet or beyond. They're ratchet strapped together, and then they have a plug at top, and they're filled with water. The water gives them the weight, keeps them into place, and that can handle freeze, thaw. This, this can handle the coldest of cold conditions, and when they're done using it, all they have to do is release the drain plug at the bottom and drain all the water out, and again, it's lightweight. You pick it up and carry it. And they must have more than one size. That's what your notch is? That's what the notch is. It's a lower height. Yep. So with the flood protection, just like they would do ditch checks, they determine what size they want. And they can put two foot units and they have the same socket adjacent to three foot units, four foot units and beyond. They're, by the way, when we get into flood protection, they're the only FM global approved four foot flood protection as tested by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at Vicksburg, Mississippi. And that's more than we intended to talk about. Yeah. The before and after. There's the uh, straw bales that were getting blown out. And that's not going to work. Not going to work. And now the muscle wall's in place, and it's going to work as long as you need it. Excellent. Very excellent. Great pictures. And this is an application that will be repeatable. Good deal. Thank you. I get to keep going. Okay. So inlet protection. Um, you know, and some yeah, right people on, on this thing's probably seen these slides 15 years ago. But some things really don't change a whole lot. Over the years, there's been a lot of attempts at inlet protection. I think we've come a long way. Um, we definitely have gotten away from chia pets. <laughs> ch -ch -ch chia. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, That's not the only use for straw. It's, what's the guy from the Wizard of Oz? What's he say? If I only had a brain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's good. Um, so, you know, straw bales are a dam. And, and what we really want to do in inland protection, one of the reasons that they require the stormwater products to go in first on a, on a job is so they can work. Well, the last thing you want to do then is dam them up so they don't. Um, so straw bales are really not a great option. We have seen people create things with, with uh, wood and whatever. But again, they don't care what the silt fence is. If this was a high porosity silt fence, 
this might have worked great, but nobody that designed this ever knew that that existed. That looks like something Tim the Toolman Taylor would build. That's all that lumber. Good. And then this is sometimes, although a whole lot less, sometimes what you see in inlet, and hopefully we don't see much of that anymore. Um, and I think we don't. I think we've come a long way. Um, so we have some great inlet protection, protection products, and it varies depending upon the type of inlet. Here's a four-way flat top inlet, huge in St. Louis. Clinton. We do see it in some other areas. Um, this is basically a high flow fabric that, that has rebar and metal on the corners. It's very easy to install. I bet Clinton would tell you it'd take you 10 minutes probably to install this. Um, you put the corners in place and then you put these crossbars in place and you're done. And you go, again, that's an open fabric. You're not going to allow for any sediment to be built up in there. That's the sediment that got built up. Well, this is one of the very first ones that Clinton put together. Uh, very impressive. And you can really see that that you know, the water was higher than that, and that, that sediment actually fell off the face of it. So, you know, when you're cleaning this out, besides, you know, scooping out all the sediment, getting ready for the next storm event, you also want to kind of scrape off that fabric just so it flows a little better initially. Again, a great solution. Uh, should, should see you using it more. The guy that developed this in St. Louis uh, does a lot of residential lots, a lot of small sites, mm -hmm. and they're the, they're the hardest for SWIP management. You have so many different trades coming in and out. All of the adjacent lots are on different time schedules. It's almost impossible to keep mud off the streets. It's a huge challenge to keep it out of the stormwater system. And he developed this because he was being hired to try to solve those problems. Yep, yep. Um, and this was actually before the inlet when he came out with the curb inlet protector. Uh, this is Big Red. Um, it is that same high flow fabric, but it's filled with uh, recycled shredded tires. Um, and so what that does is slow that water down a little bit more than just going through the fabric, but it's fairly heavy. It stays in place but it actually will slow that water down, allow the, the sediment to fall out. And there's no steel belts or metal in No, there. it goes through the, a magnetic thing that gets all that steel out of it. It's, I think it's 98% or whatever they say, but it's, yeah, it's and, good, and, good rubber. And some people are really thrilled because you're doing something with this post-consumer product. What do you do with the rubber? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Excellent. And kind of since then, there's been other companies that have created something similar, but this was actually the first one. It's got handles on it. Again, one of the great things is that you lay it down you might stomp your foot on a little bit, make sure that it's got contact with the concrete. You're done. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit, going, going to Dandy. Dandy's got several products that we use throughout the area. Um, this one specifically is Dandy Beaver Dam. And the reason that it's two different things, so that's a curb inlet with a, a grate in front of it. So the grate slides into the pocket, and then that, that tube behind it has uh, HDPE pipe in it, slotted pipe. that allows water to go through, but again, slow that water down. Um, and here is without the grate. So this is just the uh, uh, dandy curb. With the woven monofilament. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that's a little, it's a little time consuming, not terrible, but you do have to fill that bag in the front with gravel. Uh, it's got Velcro and it's pretty easy to do. Um, and that's why actually we went from this to the, uh, the uh, rip Big Red. And then Dandy kind of also came on with the, the recycled uh, rubber. And that's actually a very strong fabric. That's a filter weave fabric. We'll talk about what that is um, in a minute here. Uh, but you can see that that is even stronger. So that, that can handle a little more tire running into it. And then on the other picture, you got really the, the cheapest end of it. That's a gravel bag. Uh, typically, you're going to fill that yourself on site. But you can fill that with gravel if you want to. And sometimes some municipalities feel like these the rubber products can tend to move as the water kind of gets, uh, as a lot of water is coming through it, obviously that gravel is going to hold it down. More. Bowman deals with a lot of these in the uh, Colorado wow. market. Yep, absolutely. Going back to Dandy, so this is a four-way or a, a graded inlet. Um, that that grate just gets pulled out, put in that bag, puts right back in there. Looks like a hot pizza delivery bag. It does actually. <laughs> um, and you know, the, the, we like that idea because you it's on the surface, so you see it. Um, because it's next one, and don't get me wrong, a lot of people use this. But this is once this is inside the grate, you really got to have good uh, people maintaining What's it. What's that saying? Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, Big time. very much so. Uh, but again, this is a good solution, and one of the values it has here is that some people say that this one can you really drive over it, whereas this one obviously you can because you're driving over the grate. So it, it's a kind of individual preference, I think. Some and as what with Dandy Sack, once that came on. There's really kind of a plethora of other things that have been out there. Urtech has one. Again, it's kind of that Urtech open. Uh, I think they do have some kind of fabric inside of that. But again, put it up against there. Uh, and again, just to do some filtering, but more just slow the water down. And the one in the middle was the area inlet. So they could put that on a hard surface. Yep, yep. And I think the slotted drain one's really That neat. is a cool one. I've never seen that in, in use, but we've done some slotted drain before. And we it's just had to take idea. fabric and go right yeah, on top exactly. of the leg, So 
yeah, that is kind of cool. Um, and then there's a variety of witches hats, some people <laughs> call them, different fabrics. Um, one of the things I think you always got to think about is if this fabric plugs, what's going to happen, right? Uh, because that's really the key component. And what I think I've seen more than anything mm. is now mm. having some kind of overflow on most product, because this is kind of a problem. I mean, granted, again, it's only maybe three or four inches, two or three inches deep, but somebody's got to get out there in their boots. And that would be heavy. And you got a lot of sediment going around it. You can't just jab it. It's going to go right back into yeah, your Yeah, it would water. be a challenge. I think it would be a challenge. Uh, here, this is Cascades uh, Catch Base and Inserts. They do a ton of these. This is actually even post-construction where they're starting to use these in all commercial development or commercial really? uh, structures where they have to protect their inlets, even post-construction. As long as somebody's keeping an eye on them. Well, they, they have to do quarterly or yearly inspections for sure. Yep. Okay. One thing I want to get back to on the specification for the fabrics. And again, this just goes back to the importance of understanding geotextile. Here's, here's the key element of about two thirds of the way down, you see water flow rate, 365 gallons per minute. So if we used a, a, a like 500 X, a slit tape woven fabric that does five gallons per minute, that's really not going to do that in the, any good, right? It's basically, basically going to be a dam Water's not going to go there. It's going to find someplace else, hopefully not go over a curb and cause some issues. So it's just important to understand fabrics and understand flow rates. All right. You keep watching. Um, <laughs> turbidity barriers. We're going to just breeze the surface of this one because this you could do a whole hour on this one. Turbidity barriers are something that are unique. Everybody kind of doesn't really understand them. And we're going to try and at least get you to understand the, the fundamentals of it. It has typically some kind of flotation pocket at the top. Um, they're going to be wired together with these adjoining panels. Um, and then there's going to be some kind of weight on the bottom, some kind of ballast that's going to hold that bottom down. And we're going to talk about how tall they should be and based on your water, et cetera. And then all this is vinyl coated. So it's, it's long lasting. You could reuse them if you wanted to clean them up. So they usually go in three different types depending on water volume. So low, no current, you're type one. Faster currents, be careful when you say faster. This isn't a stream, um, but move, water movement, type two. And then type three can handle a little bit more, but it's got a fabric in it. We're going to talk about that. So here we have type one. Again, just like you saw in that previous slide, one of the key elements is, oops, is, uh, I thought it said on here, one foot per second. It does. Yeah. No more than one foot per second. That's nothing, right? So that's really... You're, you're trying to do something on the edge of a lake or something like that. We'll talk about it. Yeah, hopefully it's not too windy of a day. Yeah, not a whole lot of anchoring, anything like that. Um, you, you may, but, but that's pretty straightforward. Here, we're only five feet per second. So again, that's not very strong. It is made much stronger, though. It's got some steel plates on it. It's got a much stronger cable at the top. Um, it, it is definitely a stronger device. And that's typically a lot of the, our DOT projects. It's funny, it says DOT, but... Um, you see that. And then this next one, to be honest with you, I haven't seen this on the ground. I'm sure other people within ASP and, and Cascade and Bowman and, and a quick have. This actually has a polypropylene fabric as that instead of that vinyl. So the idea is some water is going to actually go through that. Um, so again, if you know fabrics, that, that, that can be helpful when you got a lot of water. So again, the, right, the left picture is what you're going to realize. We're not putting this on the bottom of, of hopefully a lake or a very small stream. Water is going to get underneath it. What we're trying to do is just slow that water down so that, again, so sediment can get uh, uh, fall out. This is typically where we see a lot of them. We, we see, even in a river situation, maybe, um, but it's where we're just trying to take a se section out because we're working in that white section, and we just want to keep that sediment localized. And we do a lot of river bank and stream bank stabilization projects. Yes, we do. And what's funny, which we won't talk about, is as muscle wall is kind of taking that over because it can do this plus a lot more. Big but, time. Um, and, and again, we never want to put this across a stream unless it's a one foot or five feet per second stream, which there's not many of those because you, they just can't handle it. You need to have good sediment control upstream of that, that you're not worried about moving water and trying to keep uh, sediment out of the stream. And this is some good examples. Here you got a, you know, you got a dredging uh, deal at the, the top left. Here we got a lot of work going on, which is pretty impressive to see that they've been able to separate out that water. And again, it's just trying to localize that sediment because ultimately, really, if you're going to do it right, once you get done, then you're going to have to figure out a way to get that sediment back out of the water. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I know we're getting through them quick, but I think we're staying on time. We're pretty well, yeah, good. We're doing great. Um, dewatering bags. Dewatering bags, you know. 10 years ago, probably didn't even exist, or if it did, 
it was it take you two weeks to get. Dewatering bags now, every location has three or four different sizes. It's really gotten to be a thing. And it makes some sense. If you're going to pump out a utility trench or some big hole that's been dug and it rained, you don't want to just take that muddy water and throw it in the stream, right? You just spent all this money with sediment control devices trying to hold back surface water. Now you got a pumping situation. And these dewatering bags can really do some great things. There you can see the water kind of coming out of it. Um, again, pretty pictures like that tells me that they were started with clean water because this is <laughs> not truly clean the water. It's still going to have turbidity in it. What it's going to do is it's going to take all the solids, right? And here you can see the picture on the right. That's another one where they're pumping it out of a clean lake and putting out clean water. And it shows the point. But if you have NTU issues where you have to be a certain NTU, now we need to talk about flocculants other things to help with that. We could still maybe do that in this process, um, but that's much more than just getting the dewatering back. Yeah, and we talk about treatment trains. We can get into that here in a little bit, but when we talk about those different fabrics, as you've mentioned before, a parent and opening size, what kind of flow yep. rate is it? What kind of permittivity does it have? We can help with all of that. We mm -hmm. don't need our viewers to just all of a sudden be experts or to use Dr. Google. They can contact us and we can talk about real world, what's available, what do we know from history that works? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, even the, talking about these NTUs, we've done some treatment trains where you're mm -hmm. putting into different tanks and you get cleaner water, you de decant the cleaner water off the surface, go to the next one, treat it again, can certainly do it. Uh, but nevertheless, a dewatering bag is required in most cases if you're pumping almost anything out of, out of a utility trench or anything like that. No, look at that video, let it run. <laughs> this this is fair claw skimmer you know there's some other skimmers that, that we've seen at ICA and different things but th th these guys figured it out a long time ago um you know there's a bunch of different sizes eight different sizes depending upon your flow and what they're showing you here is this orifice so we're going to talk about this orifice in a little, a little bit more but what this is doing is just like I said earlier it's going to decant the water off the surface because if, if water is in a sediment basin and that sediment's tart, starting to fall the surface water is the cleanest, right? Yep. So what makes sense but to get the cleanest water? Um, and, and to that end, Fairclaw Skimmer has some great sizing calculators online um, that can really show you, based on the water that you're trying to treat, what size skimmer, and even to go so far as then what size orifice. And here's the orifice. So they're going to give you, so that even gives you more uh, flexibility. So there's, you got to, Three inch, four inch, five inch, six inch skimmer, which a six inch skimmer is huge. I think there might even be an eight. Um, but by adjusting the size of that orifice, controls on how much water you're moving through. Um, and that can be huge, both for your existing project where you want to try and keep as much water in that sediment basin as possible. But then on the next one that's maybe a half acre bigger, maybe all you have to do is change the size of the orifice. So that's something unique to uh, Faircloth for sure. And they've really got the charts to back it up of what size what size orifice based on the volume of water. And they love answering questions. I mean, Ed Nelson and I have talked about projects where he has multiple Faircloth skimmers on the same project. Um, and that's what these guys do. They're experts at it. And they're very great to work with. We have yeah. a great history with them. Oh yeah, it's a great, great product. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you look, you know, you take a lot of these permanent stormwater basins and you make them temporary sediment basins, and so there you see the, the outfall there, but we can just uh, retrofit a skimmer onto it. And then the other thing we haven't talked about yet is, is baffles. So where the water is coming in, you want to try and slow that water down. We've talked about this ad nauseum. But the cleaner the water is as it gets closer to the skimmer, obviously, the more effective it's going to be. Um, and here you can see this one even used notches in a silt fence. So the water is trying to serpentine through That's here. That's pretty creative. It is. The one thing they probably should have done was clean this out a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> but nonetheless, all that sediment didn't even get to the last one where the skimmer is. So then the skimmer can pull out the cleanest water. Can be a very effective solution. We, we have a lot of this business in Kansas City uh, and you know, the Kansas City office, and St. Louis office, Omaha, you know, over the Midwest. We, we've done a lot of work with this, but there's a lot of areas that really haven't seen them yet. And this is, this is a temporary sediment basin, right? Because there's no control structure. So here they have the silt fence and they're the smart. They have the wire back silt fence. And they, they did some notches to make that water kind of go around. And then if our water gets too high, they have a very temporary overflow, just plastic that's, that's staked down. And so that if the water gets too high, they don't have some, they don't lose their berm in the process. That's a pretty creative solution too, because you can see they're uh, close to existing trees and there's not a lot of area to work. No, there's not. There's not. No, they did a good job here. 
And then you can see they had to have maintained it because they even made the skimmer deeper. So that's where they've been digging sediment out. Well, when we talked about SWIPs and we talked about um, site solutions, when we talk about perimeter control, uh, these all go hand in hand and they're usually part of a pr construction project that has something else happening, some other activity. We have options for concrete washouts. We have this lightweight portable cardboard structure that you assemble and line it with plastic from Outpack, or we've got the more, not permanent, but the longer term, more heavily used, heavy duty versions as well. And we, we these are not a dime a dozen as far as cost, but these are really easy for us to package together with your perimeter control, with the other site solutions that you need for your BMPs to maintain your SWIP. Well, and one of the things is frequently on your sediment control inspections, they're asking you, where's your concrete washout? So while mm -hmm. this isn't sediment control specific, it's part of the compliance. No it doubt. fits. And we have some of the others that have the big bags versions, and we have, yep. we have a lot of different options, but this is just our primary go-to. Yep. Yep. But we have them at all locations, that's for sure. Uh, construction entrances is kind of a big one. Well, it is, but we're ahead of schedule, so we can we have time to do the video. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about here before we go too far is we have options. Instead of there's always the do nothing alternative that'll get you in trouble, that'll get you fined. I think as Don said, we're getting better. We don't see the terrible examples of silt fence we used to see. I think construction entrances is a place we've gotten better, but we still have room for improvement. And over the years through IECA is one place, StormCon as well, I've seen a number of different manufacturers that have their different solutions. And some of them are really cool and elaborate, but it's something that's gotta be uh, easily repeatable, reusable, something that's kind of a no brainer on how to put it down, how to use it. And I feel like this next manufacturer we're gonna talk about with FODs really nailed it. Yeah, I agree. First, first you do see the rumble strips. We do have those available as well, uh, but these have really kind of taken over the market and that's FODs. And we're going to have an interview coming up. I interviewed Adam Popenhagen, who just joined the FODs team recently. Well, let's see if the interview rolls. Talking about FODs, reusable construction entrances here. Um, yes, reusable in that you can look at it as a piece of equipment or something that you can take to every single job site. Um, return on investment is a huge thing with FODs. Uh, you're going to see your return uh, within a year to a year and a half at the very most uh, on your investment. And then these a these mats are able to be used uh, for 10 years. They're actually rated more than that, um, but you can expect a 10 year life cycle off of them. Very easy to install. Uh, usually needed a skidster uh, with some forks to install them. Even too strong people can install them into place, anchor them down, typically with uh, nails, 18 inch nails that go into any substrate. They can be used on soft substrate, on sandy substrate, and even on paved surfaces uh, as we have anchors that will go into the paved surface. These are very easy to clean. Uh, a typical skid loader uh, with a brush attachment on the front to clean out these uh, once they get uh, three quarters of the way full, uh, you brush them off and away you go. Uh, if you use different or multiple construction entrances, you can move them from entrance to entrance very easily uh, and they're able to be reused. So uh, as we think about construction sites, uh, you're gonna cut down on your maintenance by significant amount, usually 70 to 80% on the maintenance aspect. You're gonna certainly cut down on tracking, not to mention the dust uh, that is kicked up from uh, sweeping the street uh, on the maintenance activity. So uh, very easy to use, very easy to install, and can be used over and over uh, on many construction entrances. The final thing that I will say <laughs> is that we are seeing uh, a typical rock entrance uh, specified at 50 feet for an entrance. Typically, we can uh, cut that down with FODs to around 30 feet uh, and have the same or quite a bit better effectiveness. So many states are uh, able to shorten that uh, specification to 30 feet for FODs. So many good aspects uh, of using FODs uh, and I encourage you to take a look at them.
Thanks, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> you did a nice job, except for the skidster thing. Skidster. <laughs> Who calls it a skidster? Adam, are you watching this? Come on, man. Uh, one of the things that I liked when I first met Fods and Kevin Martinez, and, and we saw demonstrations of this, we put some on the ground at our ASP Enterprises location in Kansas City, and I drove my company vehicle on it. And when you drive a passenger car with passenger tires on there, you can really see how it flexes the tire. It flexes the tire the opposite direction of what it's used to, and it gets some cool angles on the flexation of the tire itself. It makes that mud fall out, rocks fall out of the tire immediately. That's why Adam was talking about the effective length. In some places where they would require a 50 foot long construction entrance with rock, that's because it's going to take that many rotations before the mud falls out of the treads. Well, this is really going to cause it to happen quickly. You yes. can walk on this if you're careful, but you have to be careful. Yeah, they actually have a really good website that can actually go through this process because, you know, we talk about re reusability and some of the other things. This one truly is. Yes, you still got to clean it and when you move it to the next site, but this thing can last. Uh, well, like he says, 10 years. And so they have a, a return on investment calculator and a couple other things on their website. You should really check that out um, because they're really, we're starting to see a lot of value. Colorado, if, if any of you all are in Colorado, we're preaching to the choir there because they see it on every corner. Uh, but we're starting to see it in other markets because now we really see the value. Initially, it was like, oh, that's expensive. I don't yeah. want to do that. But when I can use it on two or three different projects, that makes a world of difference. Oh, yeah. The two or three, it pays for itself. And they're taking it to seven, 10 different projects yeah. and having great success with it. Uh, I did have another slide that I don't think is on here. I took it off and it's a dust cloud. And what we're learning during the drought is the importance of air quality. Uh, they did say that. We had a webinar last week and yeah. they talked about the value of, of air quality and that in these dry environments, that dust is an issue, which we all see that with water trucks, right? Uh, yeah. But you can't do that at a construction entrance because then you're going to have that mud go right into the road. So this is a great alternative. After our meeting with those folks last week, where we had an internal training meeting just to remind ourselves how awesome FODS is and how to go ahead, go about um, promoting FODS to you folks and letting you know what all it can do for you. I Googled street sweepers, dust on the streets, and it's a tremendous concern. And some of the pictures were amazing. And it looked like I photoshopped them with a big dust cloud. You could barely see the skidster with the, <laughs> with the rotating broom on it. And that's a real problem because you're talking about Clinton where he has the, these very um, unique challenges with residential lots, right? Because there's so many different people coming and going. Everyone blames someone else for tracking mud on the street. They can't afford to be out there kicking up dust with a broom when somebody already bought a brand new house across the street or next to that new construction. Mm -hmm. They've got to do the best they can to keep that material on site and not let it get to the street. Uh, J.B. Dixon talks about that a lot with IECA, with what you taught him, the yeah. ABCs and one, two, yeah. threes of BMPs. Yeah. Uh, let's keep the material on the site. That's what this whole uh, technical talks webinar is about today is sediment controls. So in review, these are the different categories we talked about. Um, felt like we kind of went fast because we have a, like I said, plethora. I looked that well, word up. Bill, I think something you said early on that's important is that your local guy can tell you locally oh, yeah. what's best for you, what what's available, what the 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 people that are dealing with compliance, what they're used to seeing, and that's really where that's what this is all about: is gain some interest, make sure you understand who to get a hold of it, and any if anybody in this, uh, you're going to get a you're going to talk about Survey Monkey. Yep. Because in this survey monkey, which Bill's going to talk about, you can put on there, hey, have my have my local guy calls. Yeah, and we have uh, the Q&A that we use here. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. My friend Michael Sharp used it immediately. He loves these uh, presentations. We love you, Michael. Um, but they are very helpful. And thank you. Thanks for always attending. You're one of our definite uh, go-to guys, regular visitors. Thank you for that. I'm pumped, guys. We've had 117 people attend this today. That's amazing. Uh, we're glad you're back with us. Okay. I got something else coming up to tease you with. But the other uh, attendee asked about PDHs. What Don mentioned was the survey monkey. What we did over the last two years with our uh, webinar series was to send out the survey monkey for a couple of reasons. One, we want to verify your information, get your spelling of your name right, get your contact info so we can get your PDH certificate to you. To you. That's free, a free hour of continuing education every time we do this. And we are going to do it monthly but also to let you ask questions that didn't get asked during this session. So if you click answer live on both of those, I can do that. Uh, we've captured the questions that come through our technical talks webinar series. 
um, you can ask them with the survey monkey, ask specific questions that didn't get asked today or something that can't, comes to mind when we're done, but also tell us about specific projects. Let us know if you want someone to contact you immediately, we go through those. Madeline Drury in our office will help me go through those to assign those to our different branches. So our attendees that are participating in this today are across all four of our companies. All you have to do is reach out to us. If you want to tell us your location, where you're at, where your project is, that'll help. The more information you give us up front, the easier it is for us to help you. What about a lunch and learn? We love lunch and learns. And I even wrote a note that we're ready to visit you. Please contact us. We're ready to bring you breakfast. We can do breakfast and learn. We can do afternoon <laughs> snack and learn. But we are doing lunch and learns actively. Our manufacturers are at, asking if they can go with us. We can bring reps if you have something specific you want to talk about. Our sales reps love doing these because they give a, gives them an opportunity to learn as we give the presentation, but also to be in the room, to hear your questions, pay attention to your needs. Uh, Lynn Ewald, ASP Omaha, for example, set one up with me. Tom Facinic just did one recently, and we are able to give a list of the different solutions that we offer, stormwater solutions, green infrastructure, low impact development, but also our sediment control, erosion control, BMPs, vegetated solutions, Everything that we offer, we're able to do a lunch and learn on. Just reach out to us. Big news, really big news. So Michael, as excited as you are about the technical talk series coming back, we're pretty pumped to tell you we're bringing black. We're bringing back. What are we bringing back? Clean and green. Clean and green. Coming back next March. Yes, exciting. Uh, we, we're still kind of ironing out the dates. It'll probably be the first two weeks of March. Uh, we're going to do the, what, for the vendors, the Don's Death March. Just four cities in four days. That's the Midwest version, pre ASP yep. and quick supply. Yep. And then the following week, we'll do something in Denver and in, in Portland, Oregon. So uh, keep an eye out for those in our constant contact emails. Again, we hope we don't send too many of them. Uh, we just want to make sure that you're informed of what's going on. Uh, but that's exciting to get back into that, have vendors on site. We have a vendor, like an exhibit hall, as well as then speakers talking. And we try and make it to where the speakers are talking about something you really want to hear. Um, so that's also a good thing in a survey monkey. Survey monkey gives you the opportunity to say, hey, I haven't heard anything about something else that you want to hear that, that's in our, our plethora of things. So please give us that feedback too. Yeah, give us newsletter ideas. Um, some of you have been really good about staying in tune with our newsletters. I have what's called the engineer's note as a part of that. Uh, we're always looking for topics and suggestions and recommendations. Check out our YouTube channel. You can go back and see some of the dozens of other ones we've done in the we past. And we've got next month, October 7th, erosion control. Uh, Don can't be there. He has a conflict. So I've got another special guest who's going to co-present with me. So stay tuned. Keep Wednesday, August or October 7th open on your lunch calendar there so we'll do the same times 12 30 to 1 30 central i have the one that's exciting is your stream bank stabilization that'll be that. in november yeah thanks for the reminder put yeah. the pressure on me. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome don thanks for joining thank me. you thank you thank you everybody for being on today